Good afternoon, good evening, I should be saying to everybody. So we, I'm just going to give it a couple of minutes to let uh, people jump on. We are bang on time. So I want to allow them to come on. Okay, I'll give it one more minute. And then I will get started and we will let the people trickle in as they come in. Okay. All right. Thank you, everybody, this evening for your time. I know how valuable it is. And welcome to uh, Dr. Frank Chang's webinar, who he has kindly uh, given us his time to present some super amazing cases for you this evening. I think you're going to see quite a few things that uh, you potentially haven't seen before, which is uh, super awesome. I'll just go over a few things with Ethos. These are the upcoming events for June and July. Um, Ethos is uh, presenting itself at the most events that it ever has this year, which is super exciting for us. Um, and it's uh, been very successful. Then we've got our August events. We've got the Versa, the AIM, and then we've got a couple in Melbourne, the Adelaide Dental Symposium with City Dental. And then September is a big month. We've got AIM, we've got AMZOMs in Cairns, AIM again in Gold Coast, the Versa, AOS, ASP, ASP. Um, and then we've got a couple in October. Where to purchase Ethos? Um, if you're people that haven't used it before, please feel free to reach out um, to me post the webinar if you have any questions or um, don't have an account with any of these. You can get it from Arc Health in uh, Sydney and Brisbane, Queensland, City Dental, Adelaide, Matrix and Medident. We've got Melbourne and you've got Southern Implants. You've got VP Dental in Queensland also. A couple of housekeeping. If you do have questions, we will be running a live Q&A at the end of this with Dr. Chang. Please feel free to pop your questions into the chat Q&A box down the bottom. If you have an urgent question, uh, Dr. Chang is happy to answer them during the webinar. We will try and keep them to a minimum. But if you do have something that you want to ask uh, immediately, please mark it as urgent question and write your question and I will politely um, interrupt him and post your question so everybody can hear it. Um, CPD certificates for people that are attending this evening will be out within one to five days. The recording will be ready uh, hopefully by the end of the week. Um, and then after the webinar, we do have a survey that we would please ask you to complete for your feedback. And there's also a tick box in there to register for our Ethos newsletter. So please, if you could do that, that would be wonderful. Um, and again, I would love to thank Dr. Frank Chang for his time this evening and his dedication, putting his amazing presentation together for us this evening. And without further ado, I'll hand over to you, Dr. Chang. Um, and if you need me during the webinar, please feel free just to shout out. Great. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you for um, inviting me uh, to give this uh, webinar. Now, let me just um, load this up. Can I just check that you can see my screen? Uh, just go to share your screen. Okay, give me a second. Yes, I can see that very cold picture. <laughs> okay. All right. Excellent. You're ready to go. Excellent. Okay, great. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Frank Chang. I'm one of the oral maxillofacial surgeons. I practice in um, Perth in Western Australia. 
And again, I'd like to thank Ashley for um, inviting me to come on this webinar. So in this webinar, I'll be discussing some principles, mechanisms, and users of bone graft uh, in oral surgery. And um, in particular, I will be presenting some cases that I use um, ethos in. So bone graft is defined as an implanted material that can promote bone healing. It can promote bone regener regeneration alone or in combination with other materials like growth factors or blood products. And it is the second most transplanted um, tissue after blood. It's used widely in dentistry, in maxillofacial surgery, orthopedic surgery, trauma, and plastic surgery and podiatries, etc. So bone grafting is a surgical procedure that replaces missing bone with bone material from patient's own body, a synthetic material, artificial or natural substitute that can promote bone regeneration. For example, in the oral cavity or in the jaw, missing bone or bony defect to the alveolar ridge or mandible can develop from tooth loss, pathology, infection, trauma, or congenital malformations like cleft alveolus, just to name a few. So normal bone regeneration can occur in our body because bone tissue can regenerate into a space if there is a cavity or space created. However, the bony defect or space can also allow soft tissue to regenerate in or grow into it, resulting in insufficient bone regeneration or formation. So to prevent this, we can maintain the space of the defect or cavity with bone materials that support the regeneration of bone and the graft material then becomes integrated into this new bone or replaced by the regenerated uh, bone. So in, gen in dentistry, this is guided bone regeneration. So the goal of bone graft and regeneration is to restore the defect into its original form, eliminate the dead spaces, which can reduce infection and facilitate and enhance healing of the defect and soft tissue overlying the defect in some optimal and suboptimal conditions. There are three main mechanisms of action of bone graft to allow regeneration of bone. These are through osteoconduction, osteoinduction, and osteogenesis. Now, all of these mechanisms of action are necessary for a successful bone grafting procedure. However, the bone graft material does not need to contain all three mechanisms of action. So here we're going to go through the different mechanisms. Osteoconduction is a process which the graft material creates a scaffold passively allowing ingrowth of host capillaries, vascular tissues, and mesenchymal stem cells into the passive structure, structure of the graft material. So basically it is a scaffold which facilitates bone cells to attach to to grow and divide within the scaffold. So examples of these sort of material in osteoconductive, uh, with osteoconductive properties um, are bovine xenograft, calcium sulfate, phosphate or carbonate, hydroxyapatite corals, and bioceramic compounds. Osteoinduction is the mechanism which new bone is formed by the active recruitment of host mesenchymal stem cells from the surrounding tissues, which then differentiate into bone-forming osteoblasts. This process is facilitated by the presence of growth factors within the graft, such as BMP, so bone morphogenic protein, um, PDGF, platelet-derived growth factors, interleukins, fibroblast growth factors, vascular endothelial growth factors. And some of these examples of the osteoinductive property materials uh, fibroblast growth factors, um, xenograft, allograft, and there are some new alloplastic materials. Then the final mechanism here is the osteogenesis, which is the mechanism in which new bone is formed by the donor cells from the host body to the donor site. And the cells involved are the mesenchymal stem cells, osteoblasts, and osteocytes from the graft. And so this type of mechanism um, or bone graft property comes from autogenous bone graft. So next we're going to talk about the classification of bone graft materials. 
these materials can be auto graft, which comes from the host or the patient themselves. It's grafted from one site to another, or an allograft, which comes from um, a uh, a cow or a, a a pig porcine, and so uh, sorry, allograft <laughs> um, from a d diseased person. Sorry, um, the donor donor graft. So these could be disease donor or live donors. Then xenograft comes from a uh, porcine or a um, cow um, derivative. And then you have the alloplast, which are the synthetic materials. So all these different, four different materials can be used um, independently all together as um, a bone graft material. So we'll go through the different types here with some descriptions. So autograft is a bone graft that are harvested from one site of the host um, host body, and then is implanted into another site within the same individual. It could be cancellus or cortical or combination of cortical cancellus graft. It can be non-vascularized or vascularized bone. It contains surviving cells with osteoinductive proteins, which we mentioned before. It's osteogenic, osteoinductive, and osteoconductive. So it has all three properties of the mechanisms of bone graft. It has no immunogeneity, which enhances the chances of graft incorporation into graft site. So immunogenicity is defined as the ability of cells or tissues to provoke an immune response and is generally considered to be an undesirable physiological response. It has no associated risk of viral transmission, has no additional cost, this is from the host um, itself. It's harvested from another body site, um, but however, a patient can get donor site pain, morbidity and complications, and has a very low failure rate of 4.3%. Um, autograft can be mentioned before, cortical, cancellus, or combination. So the sources that we take them from commonly um, in, um, in the mandible, we have it from the ramus. We can harvest it from the chin, from the zygomatic bone, anterior nasal spine, coronary process, from the calvarium, or from the ilia crest or tibia. Next, we move on to allograft. Allograft is harvested from an uh, from an individual and implanted to another individual of the same species. So these are can be live donor or cadaveric um, from a diseased donor. These bone material has osteoinductive and osteoconductive um, properties. Again, these could be cortical or cancellous or cortical cancellous, and these comes in different forms, powder, particulates, um, chips, cubes, anatomical shapes. They can be mineralized or demineralized. They can be fresh, fresh frozen, or freeze-dried forms. With this type of graft, you avoid adenocyte morbidity. And these grafts have a strict tissue processing to mitigate risks of transmitting bacterial contamination and viral diseases such as HIV, Hep B, and Hep C, and um, immunological reactions. The most of these materials are treated uh, by a um, hypotonic solution, acetone, ethylene oxide, or gamma radiation. The next group are the xenograft. These are bone taken from the animal source and transplanted into your body. So again, from the bovine or porcine. These grafts are osteoconductive. They have a similar structure and biomechanical properties to human bone. They have low immunogenicity. Uh, they prolong turnover time, and they come in blocks, granules, or particulates. Finally, alloplasts. Um, these are the bone graft material made of synthetic or artificial materials. So these include bioactive materials such as calcium phosphate, calcium sulfates, uh, bioactive glasses, hydroxyapatite, polymers, um, and composite bone substitutes. So how do we select the graft material? We would um, think about these following factors. 
the selection of ideal bone graft relies on um, tissue viability, the defect size, the graft size, shape, and volume, the biomechanical and biological characteristics, uh, the graft handling properties, uh, some of the surrounding ethical issues, especially with allografts, and also associated um, complications, and finally, the cost of the material. This moves on to health econo economics. So here are some examples of the different types of the um, uh, graph materials. This first case here is a 20-year-old gentleman with a defect in the anterior mandible in the T4 and 4, 2, 4, 3 region, where he lost some teeth as a child. Over time, the this part of the mandible has undergone significant resorption, and he has presented wanting to have implant rehabilitation. So this, the option for this graft was chosen um, so that it can be harvested from his uh, ramus, and um, because it needs a larger area, and the ramus that were harvested act as a, a barrier, and then in, within this area, um, autogenous bone with some other bone material were packed into the defect. So it requires preparation. The block of ramus is harvested and divided. And then finally, this was retained with some screws in the jaw. And once the graft goes into this cavity, a membrane was inserted and the wound was closed. This is another example of autogenous bone graft where the patient has a, um, a benign but locally aggressive tumor. And this was resected. An earlier crest bone was harvested and this was transplanted into the defect and are held together by um, the plate and screws. And the defect um, gaps were packed with some autogenous uh, bone as well. Then this next group of graft is the allograft, which is from a donated bone. This was placed around the implant in the left maxilla uh, to support the uh, growth of or the regeneration of alveolar bone. Again, this was placed around the implant and um, a membrane was placed over this area to, um, to facilitate and protect the bone graft um, and, um, and the wound was finally uh, primarily closed. The next group of graft is xenograft. In this example here, this is an atrophic posterior ridge of the mandible. Um, preparations were carried out of the posterior ramus, followed by a titanium scaffold. And so this here is the xenograft, which is mixed with um, autogenous blood. This was also mixed with some autogenous um, bone shavings from the ramus. Finally, this is placed in the um, in the cage or the mesh, and um, this was fixated onto the posterior mandible with two retention screws, covered by membrane and primary closure. So this is an example of use of xenograft, but also mixed with some autogenous bone. So bone graft can be used by themselves or in combination with different different um, sources of bone. The last group is the alloplast. There are different, many different types of alloplast, um, but here I like to focus on this beta tricalcium phosphate with calcium sulfate. In this example here, um, an immediate implant was placed in the tooth 1-1 site after the tooth was removed. Um, so you can see this implant here. And the beta, beta tricalcium phosphate, calcium sulfate, uh, which is ethos, was mixed up, prepared, and um, placed over the alveolar um, ridge adjacent to the dental implant and filling in the gap between the implant and the bony socket. 
So here it is, the uh, bone graft sets in place. And finally, the wound is primarily closed. Here, I'd like to just um, show a um, quick video of how I used the um, Ethos product, the beta tricalcium phosphate calcium sulfate. It comes in a syringe. However, I like to dispense it into a dampened dish or a little container, and uh, I mix it as I require with saline to the consistency that um, that is adequate for my handling. Once so powder in a container. You start with a couple of big bashes of um, saline. You make the consistency that you need for the drafting. We turn to the next. Yeah. Sorry. Next is okay. Yeah. You are in life. Does anyone have? So there is the uh, the graft is mixed. Sorry about the uh, background noises from my anesthetist. But here you mix it into the consistency that you need. They do set and dry, so you can add a bit more saline to it um, to uh, to reconstitute it again. And here, this is uh, packed around the so implant. Molded around the implant. Yeah. 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 And the trick here is to um, dry it up with a with horse. So once you place the ethos around the implant or the graft site, you use a dry gauze and you want to leave it in there over the graft for about two minutes, one to two minutes until it sets. And once it sets, so graft, when it's dried up with the gauze, it should start to set and you would let it set for about two or three minutes before closure. So it sets quite firm. Um, and it acts as a membrane, so you don't need to place any any um, membrane on top of this. And so once it's fully set, you can primarily close the wound. So this. So the most common reason for bone graft in the oral cavity is for the placement of dental implants for oral rehabilitation, and other applications of bone graft includes. Um, situations where there's oral cancer that needs bony reconstruction with vascularized or non-vascularized uh, bone graft or bone trans transfer um, to restore continuity defect and allow for dental implant rehabilitation. Um, other pathology such as congenital malformation, such as cleft um, alveolus, um, trauma where you have bone loss, teeth loss, and then benign jaw cyst. So I will be talking a little bit more about the benign jaw cyst and bone graft um, and what are the, the thinkings and principles behind this. So odontogenic jaw cyst, um, to name three different types, the common ones, radicular cyst, periapical cyst, uh, inflammatory odontogenic cysts that arise from infection or trauma. And these cysts arise as a as the ultimate result in the pathway of tooth inflammation and necrosis of the focal tissues. And the next type is the dentigerous cyst or follicular cyst, which forms around the crown of teeth that have not yet erupted and reduced enamel uh, epithelium is still present. And the second, second most common cyst in the jaw. Then you have the odontogenic keratocyst, or OKC. It's a benign um, unicystic or multicystic intraosseous cyst of odontogenic origin with um, characteristic lining of paracarotenized stratified epith squamous epithelium uh, with a potential for aggressive infiltrative um, behavior. It is benign, but it can be locally aggressive and it can recur. So the distribution of jaw cysts in, in proportion in the population is 50, around 56% are radicular cysts, 17% redentigerous cysts, 13% azopalatine duct cysts, 11% OKC or dendronic keratocyst, cyst, and then the rest globular maxillary cysts, traumatic bone cysts, and eruption cysts are more uh, rarer. So this paper looks at um, cystic lesions of the jaw that break down to 
adult and pediatric population and what are the common types of cysts in different in these two groups of um, patients. So in the pediatric group, dentigerous cysts are the most common at 44% uh, with a mean age of 11. And then radicular cyst at 17% at with a mean age of 8. Whereas in adult population, the radicular cyst are more common, uh, 63% with a mean age of 42. And dentigerous cyst being the second most common um, at 18%. So as part of oral maxillofacial surgery procedures, we enucleate quite a bit of cysts in the jaw. And it's a routine procedure. We will usually um, don't place any graft material. However, I have found that clinically after 12 months, I get my, re my I have my referrer sending me intraoral periapical radiograph with some areas of persistent radiocency. Now, Usually at 12 months, you would expect a full healing in the cystic cavity. So this sort of appearance with radiolucency kind of models a picture whether, you know, this is a recurrence of the cyst or is it residual cyst or is it soft tissue scarring or soft tissue that's grown into these cavities. So then I thought of putting placing bone graft material to facilitate bone healing and to prevent um, soft tissue ingrowth and I started looking into literature however there weren't that many literature out there regarding grafting in the jaw cyst in this article here uh, it concluded that enucleation of jaw cysts and primary closure without bone substitute remains the state of the art in inverted commas so not quite sure um, what they are alluding to then there was a commentary paper that was um, published in response to that previous paper. And it has made some good points uh, regarding that there are several types of bony defects whose healing can run the wrong course in the separate phase of regeneration and result in the formation of cicatricial tissue or scar tissue within the cavity. And so these factors are known to reduce the regeneration capacity of the bony tissue. And they have mentioned that guided bone regeneration has established itself as a predictable, uh, very effective what method of controlling the um, reparative osteogenesis and in order to reduce infections and to accelerate bone regeneration. Um, and different type of bone grafts are increasingly being investigated for uh, filling in these defects. So again, there are a few other articles here um, that talks about placement of um, graph material in these cystic lesions. So this is one of the clinical cases that I had, had a uh, periapical lesion, which was uh, enucleated, debrided, and curataged, um, and nothing was placed in there. Primary closure was achieved, Subsequently, um, patient developed um, a significant amount of recession. So the question here is, would um, bone graft material placed in this area prevented this or not? So that's an area to investigate. So in my clinical observation, I find that um, these areas um, in these cases or you get soft tissue recession after primary closure of the wound. And in some instances, you get soft tissue perforation due to lack of support uh, for the soft tissue, overlying soft tissue, and often result in some concave deformity. A 12 month x ray shows radiolucency, which is difficult to determine whether this is a recurrence, uh, ingrown soft tissue resulting in reduced bone formation, and then it becomes difficult uh, to decide do we go back in? or do we continue monitoring this? So what is the solution? I started um, to graft um, some selective cases where I felt that defect would benefit um, from a bone graft um, or benefit from, from the bone graft in the healing and regeneration of the defect. So 
initially I grafted some cases in adults with uh, Xenograft and they given uh, me some good results. There were no um, problems. Um, I get um, x-rays from my referrers, um, endodontists mostly, um, and some general dentists with um, post-op intraoral intra per perical radiograph at six months and 12 months, and they all showed good bone regeneration. And then I also treat quite a number of um, growing patients who has these cystic lesions or perivocal lesions that were resistant to root canal treatment after an injury, um, and hence was referred to me for enucleation and curatage. Some of them were of reasonable size um, that would benefit from grafting to prevent soft tissue ingrowth um, and can obscure uh, and prevent obscure follow-up surveillance from their clinicians. However, placing graft material in a growing patient um, is sort of an area a bit unknown. Uh, can we place xenograft, um, alloplast? So I looked into the xenograft material. That the safety data sheet um, has sort of not really mentioned about uh, placing this material in a pediatric cohort. And um, there were no d real direct answers regarding this. So then I thought about allo alloplast, which is mostly synthetic and it's mineral. So in a growing child, this perhaps may cause less problem. So during my search for the material, I come across um, ethos, which is a beta tricalcium phosphate with calcium sulfate. Um, this mineral I felt might be suitable uh, for a growing individual. So the combination of beta tricalcium phosphate and calcium sulfate um, that produces an in situ hardening of the graft material. So you don't need additional stabilization with the use of a xenograft membrane. So this was a good solution um, for growing individual growing patients. The mix of beta calcium phosphate and calcium sulfate means that the resorption rate of the material is modified because these two minerals, they have different properties. The calcium sulfate can act as a barrier, which halts the ingrowth of soft tissue during the early phase of bone regeneration. Both calcium sulfate and beta calcium phosphate are fully resorbable uh, bone substitutes and there are no long-term presence of residual graft particles. The calcium sulfate element will resorb over a period of three to six weeks, um, therefore creating a vascular porosity in the beta tricalcium phosphate scaffold for improved vascular ingrowth and angiogenesis. So while the beta tricalcium phosphate element will resorb by hydrolysis um, and en enzymatic and phagocytic processes, Usually this happens over a period of nine to 16 months. It, it is a osseous inductive material and multiple papers has now suggested that these graph material are also osseous con conductive because it's resorption or replacement is a cell mediated. Um, so I guess we'll see more of the these research coming through. So here we have um, the uh, video here on the left-hand side with the ethos that comes in a, a syringe. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you can use it in a syringe or you can dish it out into a, a dish like before. My preference usually would be doing it this way so I can mix the amount of um, saline required to get to the consistency uh, that is suitable for um, uh, for what I'm doing at the time, because the defect size could be a one-sided, two-sided, three-sided. So by mixing it into the consistency, it will hold its uh, form and uh, the shape. And so then it will um, um, stay where it should be. So here you can see, as we mix this, it start to um, thicken up and 
If you leave it by itself, it will harden up in about two to three minutes. And if it does, you can add a little bit more saline and it'll um, you'll be able to mix it again. So here I'm going to show you a few examples of how I apply ethos. Um, in this case, here is a 15-year-old um, male who previously had dental trauma with periapical granuloma at 222, two, two. Um, had completion of root canal treatment, um, sorry, had root canal treatment, but the, uh, the, the, the periapical lesion did not regress, and therefore the root canal was completed and then was referred to me for nucleation, curatage, and debridement. So this is the... Um, defect after it was all uh, the granuloma was removed and cleaned up and um, this is the placement of ethos into the cavity and after it sets this next case is a um, 14 um, year old female again previous dental trauma had a root canal treatment to 232 so um, here you can see there's a periapical le peri lesion. Uh, this was after lesion was removed and debrided, and um, the ethos is placed over the defect and around the uh, the root of the tooth, and then primary closure. This next case is a um, fifty year old gentleman who had concurrent periapical lesions at tooth 2-1 and 4-6. Both, um, again, had started root canal therapy. However, the, um, the lesion did not regress and, um, again, was completed root canal therapy for nucleation of the periapical lesion and curatage. Um, so this, again, was cleaned up, debrided with peripheral ostectomy, meaning just cleaning up the surrounding bone within the cystic cavity. Then the ethos is placed for it to set. And then on the right hand side, there's a tooth 46, which you can see there's a uh, ortho band with a temporary filling there. And um, the cavity was cleaned up and ethos applied with a primary closure. This next one, again, tooth uh, 36 with a protocol lesion, debrided, cleaned up. And it's all the same process where they would uh, start having root canal treatment, waiting for the uh, regression of the um, cystic lesion or the periapical lesion. And when they um, um, are not responding, then they get um, to come in to have the curatage and the nucleation. So again, ethos placed around into the cavity and around the outside of the, um, um, the uh, mandible and primary closure. So all these cases, no membranes are required because they're set really hard. As long as you place a dry gauze over the um, area for about two to three minutes, um, it'll just uh, stay in its form. This next case is a previously nucleated um, autogenic keratocyst cyst around two, three, six, around five years ago. Um, she developed this radiolucency around two, three, six where it was previously nucleated. So within this follow-up scan, just looking at the scan, you know, from the, we don't have the previous um, scan to compare to, but is this a recurrence or is this scar, scar tissue? So we went in and um, patient liked to have the tooth removed because it's been a problem, ongoing problem uh, for this patient. So tooth was removed and it was a uh, recurrent cystic lesion and this was nucleated, debrided and the graft, the ethos of plastin. And so this x-ray here, as you can see, this is um, this, this OPG x-ray is um, about six months post-surgery and um, you can see where the previous lesion was um, and in this OPG, you can see bone here and where the tooth roots were there was some uh, bone regeneration here as well okay so 
with ongoing surveillance because it's an autogenic keratocyst, we'll continue to follow this up and um, and see what this what um, what happens with this area. But by placing the uh, bone graft in there, we prevent soft tissue ingress or ingrowth into this area, so that it doesn't um, confuse our surveillance. Uh, and again, next case, it's an adult patient with a um, a peripheral granulomatous tissue. This was debrided, uh, cleaned up, and then again, ethos was made up and placed into the cavity and over the alveolar bone. Okay. This is just one of the previous cases where um, the cyst was nucleated. And once the cyst was removed, we debride the cavity um, and um, and give it, give it a good curatage around the um, cavity and the root tooth root um, and peripheral ostectomy if required. This next case is not a case of cyst. However, it's an impacted um, lower second premolar on the left and the right side. So in preparation for orthodontic treatment, the orthodontist has requested removal of the um, the um, 3, 5, and 4, 5. So from this um, CBCT, you can see the position of the 3, 5, 4, 5. It's um, sitting in the, um, uh, in the medullary bone quite deep in here. So a lot of the cortical bone had to be removed to uh, remove, to get hold of this tooth. So once the tooth came out, um, because it was a, a fairly large cavity, so to enhance the healing process, um, ethos was placed in there. And this will help regenerate the bone and um, hopefully facilitate um, orthodontic treatment and movement as it prevents soft tissue in growing into this cavity. Again, another cystic lesion uh, enucleated in the tooth 1-1 one, one area um, and ethos place, and this is the cystic lesion that was enucleated. And so all these patients will um, return for their 12-month um, follow-up, either with myself, their um, endodontist, uh, with an intraoral periodical radiograph to look at the, uh, the bone regeneration. Um, 32 year old male with periodical granuloma um, at tooth 1-1, one, one, again previously injured, um, multiple root canal therapy, which has um, been unsuccessful. And so tooth was removed, uh, the cyst was enucleated, followed by um, placement of ethos and primary closure. So <laughs> So here I've used the, um, I mixed the syringe um, ethos with saline and um, directed the syringe into the cavity. And I dry them up with um, gauze and we can start manipulating this uh, once it's sort of semi dried and in a um, sort of slushy form, then you can start manipulating them. And um, once they dry up, they hold their uh, form and then you can primarily close it without any um, membranes. So that's all from me with these material and um, just introducing um, this beta tricalcium phosphate, calcium sulfate ethos and how I use them. And um, if you've got any questions, uh, feel free to email me. And um, yeah, that's it actually. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Your cases are phenomenal and your your documentation and images are fabulous. <laughs> I hope Thank no you. one was eating dinner while we were watching that. <laughs> uh, we have had a couple of questions come through. Yep. So uh, you can see them in the chat or I can read them out, whichever yes, you yeah, prefer. So I can see them. So um, the first question um, from John. So can ethos be mixed with enamel matrix derivative instead of saline? So I think from what the manufacturer is saying, you don't want to mix with any binder. 
So Ashley might be able to um, help us with this. Yeah, so um, Ethos has been uh, studied and had all its uh, work done mixing with saline. So we preach the predictable result from the manufacturer uh, saying to mix it with saline only. Um, having said that, I know that Peter Fairburn does um, speak of other ways and things that you can mix it with. And like uh, Dr. Chang has said, uh, as long as there's no other binding agents um, or proteins, so we don't mix it with blood, um, then you generally are okay. Um, but to be predictable and staying in the guidelines of the manufacturer, we do preach to mix it with the sterile saline only. Thank you, Ashley. Um, next question um, from Sue. Uh, any pre and post op operation radiograph with placement of graft into cystic cavity? So, yes, we always have a pre op, pre operative um, radiograph which um, are sent to me. Um, by the referring dentist. So um, commonly, you know, with these cystic lesions um, are cases where they've been resistant to root canal therapy and um, they haven't regressed. And after the surgery, I don't routinely take a post-op, immediate post-op, because there's, there's no, I don't think there's a need for that, because it's not going to change anything I do. So then I ask the referring um, clinician to um, to take an intraoral PA radiograph when they're going for a review, and often I ask them to to um, have an intraoral radiograph at um, six months and at twelve months just to look at the bone regeneration and make sure there's no recurrences. Um, so yes, there is post op X rays being taken. I just haven't included in the um, in these slides here. Um, Next one, um, Umani. So you talk, you asked the question about reaction of calcium sulfate with water normally is an irreversible process. How it can be remixed? So the what I find with this material is that the percentage of the beta calcium phosphate and um, calcium sulfate um, is a 60-30 mix, actually. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. 65-35. 65-35. Yep. So often when you mix it up, you would apply it straight away. So, and then it starts to set. But sometimes when there's a, high, a bigger volume, um, when some of these pro material are in the dampened dish, I just add a little bit more saline to, um, to make it slightly runny, and that allows me to continue with the material. So essen essentially, it is still um, a graph material that can um, help with the regeneration. Um, getting more now. Uh, next one. We can just do the next two or three okay. that come up and then we can right. always um, send them over to you. So please feel free to answer as many as you want to. Sure. Um, how do I ensure that ethos is set in the in the bloody environment? Uh, I find it very hard to get it hard. Okay, set hard. Okay. So that last video I showed you, um, that was a very bleedy cavity. But what I find that... Um, you, you need to have a really good assistant who can um, help you with the suction. Um, often I use electrocautery to stop the bleeding because some of these cyst cystic um, uh, lesions have uh, little um, feeders, uh, vascular feeders. So electrocautery is to um, to dry them up. Uh, but in that last case, it was quite a, quite a bleedy cavity. So I placed the first ethos and then you can see there was a lot of bleeding. So I put the gauze on there and I hold it for a couple of minutes and what happens is that it, um, it soaks up the blood, the ethos material tamponades the bleeding, and eventually it sets hard, and um, and, I, and I place more of the ethos over the top, and um, yeah, no, there's no more bleeding. So I guess it's just placing the gauze over your graft material and um, just give it time. Otherwise, um, electrocautery to help um, dry up the surgical field um, is probably the other, the other option if you have it. 
Um, next one, would I prefer using ethos for a preservation socket? So I don't see um, why you can't use that for socket preservation because the resorption time uh, that it takes um, is adequate enough for bone regeneration. Um, and so that can also res stop the resorption. So mostly the average reentry time um, for implant surgery is reported to be about um, 10 weeks. I go back in at, um, at about um, uh, 12 weeks. So I still find that um, the bone, there's adequate amount of bone regeneration. Oh, actually, I've just answered the next question as well. Um, that's all. That's it. Excellent. All right. So any other questions that come through or if anybody has any other questions they haven't submitted, please feel free to submit them to myself or Dr. Chang's email is on the screen at the moment. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Chang. Like I said, that was absolutely wonderful. I know your time is precious and valuable. Um, so thank you once again. And thank you to everybody that has joined on this evening. Uh, there is an question about the CPD certificate. So those who have attended this evening, you can expect your CPD certificates within one to five days and the recording will follow uh, in about five days. Um, so you will all get the recording of this webinar also. Uh, so once again, thank you all so very much and we look forward to the next webinar with Ethos. Right. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks everyone.